And our sharing today comes from the book of 1 Corinthians. The book of 1 Corinthians. And I'm picking this from the sharing that we had last Sunday. Pastor Francis took us through the book of Romans in what I would call a very splendid way. And uh, I want to attempt to preach like Pastor Francis. <laughs> and so we're looking at the book of 1 Corinthians. Uh, First Corinthians is, uh, before you even do that, uh, let me say this. We want to look at the gift of speaking in tongues and many others that uh, the Spirit of the Lord has given to us. And Scripture tells us that he gives to every man as he desires. He gives these gifts liberally. He, gives, he is more than willing to give these gifts of the Spirit. And if you desire... It's going to happen. But as we look at speaking in tongues, we want to look at what Paul says about speaking in tongues in our worship service, like the one that we have. Uh, when we had the moment of silence, I was expecting that, yes, somebody would uh, just bring out a word. And I waited and waited. It should have been a very good illustration for our lesson. Uh, so, that's what we want to narrow down on. But along the way, we'll touch on many other things that Paul talks about in this book of 1 Corinthians. The writer of this book uh, is Paul, the apostle. And we get that from the text itself. Uh, chapter number 1, verse number 1. Uh, gives us the proof or tells us who is the writer of this great letter to the Corinthians. It says, Paul called to be an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God and our brother, uh, that one, to the church of God in Corinth. That tells you he's the one who has written uh, that letter. Um, and this letter was written in 55 AD. This is just a little background of uh, uh, the letter of uh, Corinthians, 1 Corinthians. And the purpose was to identify the problem in Corinth, in the church in Corinth. That is why he writes. And he writes so that he can offer solutions to the church and be able to handle what is happening amongst the believers. And in a way, tell the believers, instruct, challenge them how to live a godly life in a corrupt society. Like we shall just find out shortly. The audience, number one of this letter, like we have read, is the Corinthian church. That does not, by any chance, disqualify us from being the audience of this letter. But when he wrote first, I'm not sure he knew my name. He actually didn't know you, but he knew the Corinthians. He was with them, he founded the church, and he has heard that there are things that are happening in the church. And so he addresses them. And he, he's challenging them on how to uh, live godly lives in the society that they are in. And so it is important for us to know. And every time we're going to read the Bible or you're doing your study, it's important to know who was this letter in the first instant intended for. Now that helps you to be able to separate things that are said there that might not resonate with you. Okay. So that if you realize that this letter was written to somebody called Corinth, and after they have read it, because of reasons of faith and being the children of, of God by faith, then it has come to us. And there are lessons that we can pick from the church in Corinth and apply to our lives today. Amen? And so that's very important. Now, a little background about, the, uh, about uh, uh, Corinth. We are told that Corinth was a chief city in Greece because a lot of trade was happening. Commerce, politics, Greece. We would say uh, Corinth was, was a big uh, city in as far as this was concerned. The situation of Corinth was at crossroads. And this means that travelers would come from far and wide and traders would come. And as they came, 
they brought in their influences and they picked what was in Corinth. Do you know of any town that is a, a transit point from where you come from? A town like... Yes? Huh? Busia. <laughs> you know Busia is cosmopolitan. Everybody goes there. The whites, the blacks, everybody. The rich, the poor. Why? Because it is a transit point. People are passing, coming in through Busia. Now, as they come in, they pick things. They pick, if you want, um, what is happening in Busia. And when we're saying passing, it might not just mean that you just passed through or you drove through. Passing would mean you went to Busia, you were there for a night, and then you left for Uganda, wherever else. Now, as you spend in Busia, you will pick certain things. And, of course, you will go with your certain things. Now, Corinth was like that. It was a place where people would meet. In fact, somebody would say that it was a melting pot of cultures. So there was no culture there because everybody went there and they brought their cultures. And that had influences to the people that were living there. And in fact, the church that we are talking about. Very fast, uh, the trade that happened there uh, followed through the city from, um, flowed through the city from uh, Italy and Spain to the west, and from Asia Minor and Egypt to the east. Corinth, the, the, the culture in Corinth, being uh, a Greek city or a city in Greece, in, in the Greek, um, their culture was a lot more of what the Greek people were doing. Now, the Greeks are known to be very wise, very philosophical. But they had also other extremes, and we're going to uh, see them in a short while. It is also said that religion was blossoming in uh, uh, Corinth. And it is said that at some point, at one point in time, there were 12 temples, different religions in the city, and these were huge places that people would meet. One amongst them that is so infamous was the temple of Aphrodite. Now, Aphrodite was a god of love. And because of that, then there was a lot of worship that was happening of the goddess of uh, love, Aphrodite. And the worshippers therefore practiced what was known as religious prostitution. So this was happening in, in, in Corinth. And so because of that, then immorality was so high in Corinth. It was so unbridled. It was so much un, uncontained that it was known that if you are Corinthian, then you are immoral. They would almost say, now, if you are from Corinth, we know the things that you do. Did you know that there was a time if you said you were going to Koinange, people would look at you and say, excuse me? But, and their business is in Koinange. Banks even. Kuna bank. <laughs> but if you said you're coming from Corinth, people would know, mm -mm, this one. We know the things you do. Now, that was the, uh, the state of uh, immorality that was in Corinth. It is said that at one point in time, there were 1,000 sacred priestess, prostitutes that served in her temple. It is no wonder then that uh, we would have Paul address the issues that come about. In the book of 1 Corinthians chapter number 6, it's recorded of a case of a young man who had taken his father's wife. When I mean taken his father's wife, he really took his father's wife. The most interesting thing is that even the people in church did not talk about it. They actually tolerated what was happening. It's like, well, oh, it's okay. If you decided to do this, <laughs> it's okay. Your father's wife? And so we look at what is this that Paul then addresses in this church. And we would uh, 
as we look at the things that Paul talks about, he addresses a church that is living in this kind of a, an environment, but requiring the people of God, if you'd want, the Christians, to continually live a life of sanctification. We see it in Corinth. We see it today. In fact, the things that Paul addresses in Corinth, we are seeing them today in our cities, in the city of Zimmerman even. Now, it is a call upon us to continually sanctify ourselves. Now, the process of sanctification is what you would call working out your salvation with fear and trembling. Yani unakau kitetemeka, vile umeokoka. Trembo. Trembo. Now, that means that you are in an environment like the one that we have, but you're living for God. Now, the problem that many of us have is that we have a problem that we cannot be able to detach from our cultures. Just in case. In fact, that debate is, is on. Like, what was Kiambu? Mukosawa. Your rep. Your, your women rep. Sisi Yatuko Kiambu. We are safe. Says, oh, it's okay. Let a man marry two or three or four. It's okay. And you know, because this is a leader, unless we stand and sanctify ourselves, the Kiambu people, <laughs> it is going to affect the people in Kiambu. Because there are people who follow what the leaders say. And what the leaders say is powerful because God has allowed them to be there. So we have to decide to kiskia hi, to nakata, to nakanso. We, we don't actually need to go to Corinth. It is here, right here with us. And so Paul comes to us and we see a heart of a man who is concerned about his people. We see a man, a pastor, concerned about the church that he founded. We see a man whose heart is that of a parent. If you heard that your, your son or your daughter was in Corinth and you had an opportunity to talk to them, what would you do? Oh, now, let, let's even think this way. You have an opportunity every day to talk to your son or your daughter, wherever they are. Because you don't have to wait until you do a letter like Paul did. If it was in these days, angekuwa na WhatsApp, my SMS, ati nimeona nini? Anaford, iiko kwenu. What are you doing? How is your heart towards that young man, young girl, in that city? In, in fact, in this city of Zimmerman, are you concerned about them? Do you have the heart of this pastor? Pastor Paul. Do you have this heart? In fact, we need to say that this is the heart of God concerning we, his people. And so those are issues that Paul brings out. Is this relevant to us today? I would say yes. Because this letter speaks to us today. We have identified that we have all these issues with us. The environment that we live in. The immaturity even that we find amongst the believers. The divisions. We belong to this sect. We belong to this faction. And, and, and during, during Paul's time, there are those who belonged to Paul. They were the disciples of Paul because he was the man. They knew Paul. There are those who said, we belong to Apollos. There are those who are saying we belong to Jesus. And Paul is asking, did Apollo die for you? Did I even, he actually says, did I baptize any one of you, apart from a few guys? I don't, I didn't even baptize you. And he's saying, there is none of us who owns any one of us. We all belong to God. And so, we shouldn't have divisions amongst us as believers. He talks about the immorality. We've just alluded to that. Jealousy. Lawsuits. Brothers and sisters taking each other to court. And those courts are courts that the people who sit there are heathens. And we cannot be able to arbitrate these issues, yet we belong to the same God. As we look at the gift of speaking in tongues, you realize that every gift that is given, and none is better than the other, none is higher than the other, they are given by the same God. The same spirit gives the different gift scenes that we see. 
And so none of us is better than the other per se because of the giftings that we have. How about marital difficulties and situations that we find amongst those that are married? Mpango wakando. Divorce. You get married today and six months down the line, you're thinking, mm -mm, this is not what I wanted. I feel like I've been cheated. Cheated? It is here with us. People just decide to walk out of marriage. And you know you called us here and you said vows and you, you actually used our money. We, we brought gifts and then you divorced. You cannot divorce. <laughs> and God hates divorce. And because we are like God, we also hate it. It was in Corinth. It is here today with us. Ir immorality, perversions, if you'd want. You know, men who have debased minds, darkened understanding, doing things that even animals don't do. You know, because we're living in a, in a in an, in an environment that has overrated uh, the area of sex, we find ourselves doing very, very weird things. <laughs> I like a friend of mine who says, there is nobody who ever died because of not having sex. I'm sorry to talk about this in second service. If it was elsewhere, it would be okay. <laughs> nobody. Nobody died. See, I'm starving from this thing. Have you found anyone? <laughs> and then he says, or you find this ambulance, ikona siren, kuna mugonjwa ndani. What are they missing? Mm, this thing. So where are we rushing them? <laughs> kinyata. <laughs> Nafika kinyata nuza, nani ako available? Oh, nani? <laughs> we have never seen. <laughs> I'm not sure we're going to see. But because we have been preached to by the media, <laughs> they have told us, if you're not doing this, you're missing out. Time would fail us to get into the details and see how so small time it takes and yet we peg big decisions on that area that a pastor ordained reverend gari mafuta unaenda embu did you see that story <laughs> I, i'm thinking if they were caught by washirika pastor uko wapi i am on safari naelekea naelekea embu what are you going to do oh huduma kuna huduma and then the pastor is caught in some dingy places with some woman. Why? Because we don't need to go to Corinth. Paul is speaking to us today. And so, he talks about all those things, but allow me in like the next couple of minutes, talk about the gift of speaking in tongues. We have identified that, yes, Maybe this, the address of this letter was wrong. It should have been the letter to Zimmerman DCAK. It would land here and all of us say, oh yeah, this is us. He's talking about us. True or true? The gifts, uh, the gift of speaking in tongues in chapters 11, 12, 13, and 14 of uh, uh, the book of uh, 1 Corinthians are devoted to spiritual conduct. How you handle yourself with the gifts that the Lord has given you. Speaking in tongues, therefore, we will realize that it is first and foremost a gift. We appreciate speaking in tongues is a gift. It's a gift given by the Spirit. In the book of Acts chapter 2 and verse number 4, it talks about all were filled. Chapter 2 and number, Acts 2 and verse number 4. All were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. It's the Spirit who gave and enabled them to speak. So it is not yours. Number two, anyone who speaks in tongues, hear this, brothers and sisters, speaks to God and edifies himself. So as you speak and bubble in tongues, wonderful thing to desire actually to have. But as you get it, know that this gift is for personal 
edification. And nobody understands what you say when you speak in tongues. Tell me, what did I say? God understands. Do I enjoy it? I feel good. That's edification. That is the purpose for that gift. And if this is going to happen amongst us, if we come together, says so in uh, 1 Corinthians 14 and 23, if you give us that. Fourteen, First Corinthians 14 and verse 23. So if the whole church comes together and everyone speaks in tongues, and some who do not understand or some unbelievers come in, will they not say that you are out of your mind? Continue. But if an unbeliever, someone who does not understand, comes in while everybody is prophesying, he will be convinced by all that he is a sinner and will be judged by all. The gift of speaking in tongues. If we speak in tongues, we edify ourselves, we speak to God. If we do it in the congregation of saints, the unbeliever amongst us will not understand what we are saying. They will think we are mad. Scripture says, out of your mind. You, are, you left your mind, you came out. So you are mindless. So, Paul addresses this issue because it was there in the church in Corinth and says, if this is going to happen, therefore, if anyone speaks in tongues, verses 27 of chapter number 14, 1 Corinthians 14, 27 to 28, if you'd give us that, if anyone speaks in a tongue, two or at the most three should speak and hear this, one at a time. And someone must interpret. If there is no interpreter, the speaker should please keep quiet in the church and speak to himself and God. By no means am I speaking against the gift of speaking in tongues. But there needs to be an orderly way of doing things. And Paul says, because if we miss out on the order, if all of us are speaking in tongues, in the congregation of the saints, meaning we have two, three people and they are speaking in tongues, who will know what is happening or what the Lord is saying? What needs to happen is if there is speaking in tongues in the congregation or in the worship service, we have to wait for each other. Indeed, in the, in the, in the sharing of the Holy Communion, he addresses the same issue because it was still there in the church in Corinth and people were going to celebrate the Holy Communion, but they ate like, I have not eaten for several days. I have found this provided by Bishop Jimmy. Please, enjoy. And in doing that, they missed the most important thing that all of us need to remember, that Jesus Christ died for us, and because of that, we are different people. It is not the substance, it is not the bread, or the wine, or the Rabina or the buffalo. No. If we miss out because we are looking at the emblems, when we are just like the people in the church of Corinth who could not wait for each other. And Paul says, when you come into the Lord's table, wait for each other. There should be order in God's house. Because if we don't have that order, then we will miss out on the very, very important thing that Paul is telling us. The same case happens if there is no order as we handle this gifting of tongues, then we miss out on what God is saying. And so if we speak in tongues, then we need to interpret. Therefore, brothers and sisters, be liberated from the people who will come to speak to you in tongues and they are telling you God is saying certain things and you cannot understand. Do not allow people to take advantage of you because they spoke in a few tongues and you cannot understand. They were supposed to be speaking to God 
and edifying themselves. If God is speaking through tongues, then interpretation needs to be made. And he likens that to the lifeless things that we have. He talks about the pipe. The harp without a distinction of notes. No one knows what we are playing. We want to ask Joshua, because he's here, just to play and don't, don't be, don't address, don't be obedient to the notes. Just play and then you tell us. Joshua has a problem of not being able to play with the notes because he's just play without, you know, addressing the notes. Anything. Because that's what Paul is telling us. <laughs> that is very organized, isn't it? But when it is addressed well and the notes are arranged, you are able to decode. The same is happening to the gift of speaking in tongues. We cannot understand. We do not know what you say when you speak in tongues. But it is good. Keep speaking to God. Keep edifying yourself. But when it is for the congregation, make sure there is order in terms of speak and interpret. Or speak and there will be an interpreter. The Spirit of the Lord being in the prophet and enabling the prophet to prophesy, God gives the ability to the prophet to handle that spirit. And this was happening because in this church that Paul had founded, people had come to the realization that yes, God is available for us. Jews and Gentiles alike, men and women. Remember when uh, Pastor Francis was talking about the Jewish men and the kind of prayer that he used to pray every day? Thank God I'm not a woman. But women have just come to a point where they have realized, wow, we can get access to God. And so there's disorder in this church. They are prophesying. They no longer want to submit to their husbands. Why? Because God is speaking to them. And he brings out this lesson. There, needs, there is need for us as we prophesy, as we speak in tongues, to know that the spirit of a prophet is subject to the prophet. And so it is not possible for us to allow because you are this gifted believer to go messing people up. Ah, there is something the Lord has said to me about you. You take advantage of a believers. You misguide and misdirect. That shall not have a place in the believers seated here. Because there needs to be order in God's house. And Paul says in, uh, as he ends the uh, 1 Corinthians uh, 14, 37 to 40, if you'd read, he says, be careful. Do not ignore the instructions that Paul gives. And he says that everything needs to be done in order. Everything needs to be done in order. And I know that as, as we have been going through this and touching on the issues that Paul talked to uh, the church in Corinth about, that you could be here seated and you're saying, why is he even bothered about talking about Corinth? Talk about me. Divisions amongst us. Immorality. We have factions. Factions within the church. And you say, no, I belong to this one. I belong to the other. And we are fighting. Marital issues amongst us. Husband and wife cannot see eye to eye. We are believers, and we even have the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Paul is saying, this need not happen. This need not be, because there is need for you to continually keep 
being sanctified, to continually progress in the way that God wants us to go. And in those many things that we have talked about, you could be here and that is your situation. You are the Corinthian church. And brothers and sisters, here is this. Paul is not talking about people who are out there. He's talking about us in the church. If you say these things about unbelievers, people who do not know Christ, it's like, what else do you expect us to know? This is our life. But he writes this letter because he is addressing we in the church, the Christians in the church of Corinth, who were supposed to be different, but this is the kind of life they were leading. And you could be here, and you're saying, now that is me, a Corinthian. I want to know Christ. I want to invite the choir to come over. And we're looking at our lives, you're looking to God, you're asking God, where did we go wrong? You're telling God, this is my situation. I am the Corinthian church. I have actually agreed with the preacher that yes, I have issues in this area. It is only God who can help us. We need this help because this is the way to sanctify ourselves. The process of sanctification continues from the day you give your life to Jesus to the time that you'll be translated into the next world. And at no one point should that process be halted or stop. It is a continuous process. And so I want to call upon us, if you're there, and you need Jesus to come into your life and organize what needs to be organized, because you have been called, I have been called to a life of sanctification. As we do what God has given to us to do, let us not be carried away by the gifts that God has given us, by the abilities that God has given us, by the enablement that we even have, that we forget that we need to keep sanctified every day. So are you there? And you're saying, I am that non-believer amongst you. When you speak in tongues, I actually don't know what you're saying. In fact, I think you're mad. But you found yourself in the house today. You could become a partaker of this.